All right, it's good to, to have everyone joining us um, this afternoon. Um, apologies for the late start. Um, you know, we're in this era where technology is our best friend. And also, you know, your friend can remind you, you know, what sort of friendship you have. So humble apologies about that. We have to just um, acknowledge our friend and how we operate with our friends. Um, my name is Corey Hyde. I will be your co-host today, along with our lovely Soraya Boy, and she is the Membership and Communications Director for Jamaicans Inspired. I'm your Regional Director, and we have um, two guests online just now. We'll be joined by Althea um, Smith a little bit later on. Um, Apologies for Sanjay Alassia. Um, she's not feeling well um, today, and she extends her apologies um, to you, the listening um, public and valid members. Um, so we have a very robust discussion that we would like to get into. And at this point, I'll invite my, my co-host, Soraya Boeing, um, just to give you a rundown as to what we will be discussing today and, and how the engagement should be. Sorry. So, good evening, everyone. It's welcome to A Lot Cooler if you're in the UK. Friday evening, it's been sweltering, but not the Jamaican heat that we know. I can tell you that. So, tonight we're talking race responsibility. So, what can I say? Um, COVID, we've been on the corona coaster in, in terms of race in the UK worldwide. It's really been in the spotlight. We've had hashtag Black Lives Matter, which was set off by the murder of George Floyd, which was the most televised um, death of a black person in police custody in history and viewed by so many people. And since then, that's triggered a lot of things here in the UK in regards to race, police, school, and that's currently a hot topic right now with our young people receiving their A-level results yesterday and GCC results are due out next Thursday. And as we know, because they're not sat their exams due to COVID-19, we know that some of the results are being um, played down and this can have an impact on our young people. We'll be looking at it from the youth perspective, our interaction with the police, the workplace and most importantly how do we identify how do we move forward and how do we really look at solutions to move things forward and understand our race relation responsibility this right so what is race responsibility and um, our topic um, this afternoon um, they are built out around race responsibility um, for one identity um, how do you identify within your race? And we have Miss Primrose Granville, you know, she, she is an award-winning journalist and, of course, a community leader. Um, and as I mentioned, award-winning journalist. Um, she is quite vocal on um, topics relating to the community. And she will be um, taking on... Um, aspects of identity along with Mr. Nathaniel Pete, um, founder of the Safety Box and of course a trustee over there uh, by EY, EY Ernest and Young and that for, for the Safety Box he is responsible for youth programs and he has done extensive work as it relates to um, young offenders and especially young black youth and reintegration and whole society view. So he will be taking on some of those um, topics around how young persons are perceived, um, young persons of color, how they are perceived. And um, later on, we will look at race responsibility in the workplace. Are, are you having the right posture, and I use quote unquote, the right posture, so as to deflect racism in the workplace. Um, at this point, introduce Ms. Primrose Granville uh, for her to take um, the platform as it relates to identity. Ms. Granville. Uh, 
Uh, you're on mute. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> got to start again. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for such an important meeting. Um, it is one that you need to be actively involved in, sending in questions. And if you have any comments, those as well. We're here to talk about our race responsibility. Now, when I think of identity, one single word comes to mind for me, and that's Jamaican. I consider myself a Jamaican. I'm a very proud Jamaican. And there's nothing anyone can say or do about the little rock that I come from, that I cherish, that can change my identity or how I feel about my identity or my confidence towards my identity. However, that is not the case for many, many people. We have black Britons here who do not feel they belong anywhere. Um, if they... If they're here in the UK, they don't belong. People keep meeting them and asking them, so where do you come from? And they go, oh, I'm, oh, oh, I'm from Gloucester. No, 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 where did you come from? Uh, Gloucester. Uh, no, where did you come from originally? Oh, well, my parents are Jamaican. Oh, okay, or my parents are Nigerian. Oh, oh, so you're from Nigeria. No, but I'm from Gloucester. And if a youngster is raised hearing stuff like that consi consistently, they will automatically think, well, I don't fit anywhere. You go out to the Caribbean, wherever, whatever island, or you go to the continent, and even there, you're not, you're, not, you're not one of those people because either you speak differently or you look differently. One, one, someone told me once that they knew I came from foreign because my shoes was clean. My shoes bottom was clean. And I said to them in, in, in roaring Jamaican patois, oh, you mean my shoes clean? My shoes just look different. We know you're foreign because you just look different. So if I was born and raised in Jamaica, left there when I was 27, someone can say that to me within five years of leaving. Can you imagine a youngster here on the street who might be from uh, a background where travel is not affordable because parents are struggling to keep a roof over their head, food, food in their bellies, keeping them in school. So travel might not be that affordable. How do you then say to them, well, your identity, you're, you're, you're black British. And why do we have to say black British, why can't they just be British? Can they be Jamaican? Can they be St. Lucian? Can they be Ghanaian? What really is the identity that our youngsters are learning from their families, their, 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 their ancestors, their parents, their grandparents? Are they learning identity or are they learning it on the street? Man them out of street. You know, the youth them are out the street. Where are our children learning their identity from and what is creating this issue where they don't know they belong? Or is it coming from the hallowed halls of the establishment? That's the problem with identity right here in this country. It is a struggle. And when I look at our youngsters, I, I do, I fear for them. Thank All you. right, we'll bring Nathaniel in um, to join Primrose on that point. Um, you know, I echo a lot of what um, Primrose has said, you know, our youth are really struggling with identity. When you, when you ask a young person that's black and they're living in England, you, you say to them, okay, where do you come from? And then they say, well, I come from Jamaica, or I come from this country, or I come from that country. But then you say, where are you born? And they say, well, I'm born here. And so what we find is that there's a great disconnect and an identity issue within our young people in that they are not quite British, they're not quite Caribbean, they're not quite Jamaican, they're not quite this. And there is that gap that is inside of them, which then has a negative impact on their self-esteem, especially when they don't understand their culture because they want to belong, but then they're going to Jamaica and they're calling foreign or, you know, the English man or this or that. And, and so it's a, it's a way of really trying to empower our youth in, in uh, upskilling their knowledge of their cultural identity which is an, a critical a component of, of self-worth. Because when you can understand where you are and where you're coming from, then you're able then to uh, be in an environment which might be a little bit hostile, but you're going in with more resilience because you now have that power within yourself because the identity now is certified within you. And where we have so many great leaders that have spoken into this in, t in terms of understanding about the knowledge of our past as we look at the great 
um, the great person Marcus Garvey that that had that statement which is so powerful that you know a people without knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. This is something which is so critical um, for our young people in this generation to understand a way they don't have the self confidence within themselves or where the system now is knocking them down and they believe that they're unable to excel or unable to actually go to a higher level um because of this identity issue and this crisis it can push them into negative types of lifestyles this is where you're speaking about you know crime and violence this is where we're talking about you know um where 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 youth now are pull it pulled into drug use or or are selling drugs as a way of earning income again this leads directly into the, the role models in their life and and this is a, a, a huge problem in fact now uh, with many of our young um, black children that are growing up in these single parent homes that are now falling into lives of crime which then you know has that type of uh, pipeline in, into prison you know so identity is a real critical um, thing that I believe that many families and individuals need to start to empower them on the history of their people, um, the successes of those that have passed before them, and for them to understand the struggles that many people have actually gone through, and the shoulders to which many of we now stand on, uh, the generations that have passed before, the, un the untold stories of, of individuals that have really, have really opened up the door for you know, future generations to step into for them to actually understand that and to know that is a critical uh, part of their, their, you know, their makeup and, and will help them to, you know, identify with themselves and also with their culture. Right. Um, Soraya, uh, I, I know you've got on the agenda how, how um, certain arguments will flow. Um, picking up on the point from, from Nathaniel, you know, the identity you know, what, what, what is it on the street? What is propelling um, youngsters towards that life of, 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 of crime that they should be a target or profile? Um, that sort of thing. Um, Soraya? Well, then that kind of brings us and leads us into, um, I think, the next topic. Who are our community leaders and role models? And what does role modelling actually look like? Because then one would say that when we came here, not everybody came during Windwash. What happened? We did, was our foundation not right? Where's the disconnect happened with what our elders have left us, which doesn't seem to have really been instilled in our youngsters. There's something there that is just missing. And I would like Primrose to sort of kick that off around role modelling and where we might have got that, have we got it wrong? What is missing with our community leaders at this present time? It's not as black and white as right or wrong. So for me, my first role models were the person I, persons I saw in my home. Um, and I wanted to tie role modeling into aspiration and inspiration. So my role models were quite inspirational and they drove me to be aspirational. And one of the things I learned at a very early age that if you get a test and you get a B, whisper it quite, very quietly, because the first thing you're gonna hear is, couldn't you have done better? Now, some people will look at that as pressure, and some people will look at that as, wow, the child can never do well enough. I look at it as somebody has seen me as being aspirational you you can do better apply yourself a little bit more i was one of those lucky jamaican children i never get no beaten trust me i spent my whole childhood i had things thrown after me no slippers but i didn't really get beaten punishment yes big time some of them i remember today with tears in my eyes but i didn't get beaten because i used to be told i am not breaking my shoulders on you if you don't want to do better so when it comes to role models, who are our role models? You know, I turn on the TV and I, I see, I, I, I might glimpse a reality TV uh, screen and I see people who have sprung up, they've written their autobiography at 19 and this all about partying and living a certain kind of lifestyle. Is that what our young people are seeing as their role models? Are our role models 
the elders who, even though they've lost their sight, they sit in a chair and they just roll wisdom after wisdom off the tongue and those things stick with you while they're eating their rice and peas and chicken. And you're, you're thinking to yourself, what is that granny just there? But the words stick with you and you learn from them. Now, it is very easy to say the Windrush generation might not have created the connection. But let me tell you something that happened to the Windrush generation. They came here to a very hostile environment. If we think it's hostile now, think of what they went through. They spent their time struggling to make things better for the generation that's our age, well, my age, which is past 50, 40 odd 50. So they, they, they struggled to make life for those people. And they were so busy struggling and working together that they probably missed opportunities to actually show or, or, or actively pull their children in. But they are still very much role models. Those are the elders that I now look to. If I want advice, I call an elder first. And what's happened is that message has been carried across that you don't have to actively pull your young people into what you're doing so they can see what you're doing and see how you do what you're doing. So it's become a little bit difficult. And in a way, we need to go back to our roots, but with a new style. We're living in modern times. You know, I'm a, I'm a raging technophobe and I have a child who really wants to connect with me and he wants to connect with me playing games. What did I do? I learned to play games. I'm no good. He beats me terribly and, you know, he laughs at me, but we're connecting. And what he sees in me is my mom is trying to communicate with me the way I communicate. He does the same with me. He comes and he'll say to me, let's, let's, let's read this magazine that you brought home. And he'll read it with me. He's not going to read 10 magazines with me and I'm not going to play 20 games with him. But we're doing stuff together. So much so that he's, he's four hours away from me at university and he'll phone me up and he'll say to me, mommy, this sound right? And he'll, he tries to talk to me in Jamaican and I'm like, I don't know, do you think it's something you should be doing? And he'll ask me questions like, um, what do you think I should do? And it's a case of the fact that he calls me and he calls on his father. He calls us old and he calls us all kinds of names. You know, you don't understand the new stuff. But when the going gets tough, that boy picks up the phone and he calls one of us or he sends those one line of messages where you know something's not right so that you can call him because he's not going to call. As parents, we have to remember where we are the first role models our children see. So be be that role model as difficult as it might be some people have two three jobs some people have no job you can still be a role model with no job it's what you do with yourself that makes you the role model and you know i went through a very difficult situation i had an accident i lost my job i lost all my earning potential that's why you must have more than one income stream um, I lost all my potential. I was an early year special needs teacher. I never know what to do with myself as an unemployed person. You know, Sainsbury's never want to hire me as a checkout girl. They said the job too hard for me, I got in a pain. So here I was at home. What did I do? I didn't want my son to see me sitting at home every day watching soap operas and Judge Judy, although I love Judge Judy. No, I didn't want him to do that. I went out there and I volunteered. And in volunteering, I found myself a new career that was amazing. And, you know, he would come and say to me, oh, my friends were listening because I'm on the radio. My friends listen to you on the radio. I'm like, you tell your friends I'm on the radio? He said, yeah, I don't really talk about you much, but I tell my friends that you're on the radio because he was proud of me. I don't think he would tell his friends that my mom just sit at home all day long and watch TV. So there are lots of little things we can do. And if you become a role model for your child, you end up sometimes becoming a role model for other people for other people's children because some children don't have certain things and that's the dynamics of their family and we mustn't be consistently comparing our children and ourselves to that family over there my goddaughter is in a two-parent family you know things are different for her and she often comes to me with her issues and I said why you don't go ask your mother oh she don't look at things like you do Auntie Prim and it's knowing that that child sees you as a role model and sometimes we simply have to be the role model our children need we're already there where their parents the grandparents the aunties 
you know, you've got a child where there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue in the home. Stop burying it under the carpet like it's a great big shame. Reach out the village. It takes a village to raise a child. We have lost the village because we don't want Auntie Mary talk to, um, to Johnny Boy because she talked too loud. You know, sometimes we have to go outside there so that our, our children are seeing role models who are in their immediate environment. The other thing we have is we think role models have to be booted and suited or suited and booted. And they have to have these great big long titles and stuff like that. No, they don't. Sometimes, I'm not saying those role models are not needed because they need to see the lawyer, the doctor, the accountant, the engineer. They also need to see the gas engineer and the plumber. They might make the money nowadays. They need to see the builder. They need to see all those role models so that they see a wide spectrum of achievement and aspiration. And we need to put those people in our children's midst. They're out there in our community. We just need to get involved a little bit more and start building back that village. We've lost the village. We've completely lost the village. I'm passionate about young people. I love them more than how I love mango. And if anybody knows me listening, you know how I love mango. I love to see youngsters excel. I love to see, hear them call me and go, Auntie Prima, I want to start a little business. I want to sell phone care at a school. Yeah, man, do that. How are you going to do it? And they explain, you know, our children the, nowadays, they're savvy. The internet is their world. They can make money off of, like, who would have thought that you could make money off of talking on the internet? But they, they do that. They do that. And they run with it so beautifully. Let them do it. I learned to stop nagging my child every time I saw him on the computer. From the day that child was six and I bought him his first Game Boy, he said to me, I want to be a games designer. When he finished um, his, his, when he was doing his A-levels, I said to him, you know, why don't you um, try engineering? You know, the boy had a shoeing into a, a, a top Russell Group University. He said, no, I don't want to go there. I want to go to this university all the way in Cornwall because they have the course that I want to do. And my friend said to me, you need to now shut up and leave him alone. You are the role model for him to aspire. He's aspired to what he wants to do. In not telling him going on the road to idol, he's telling you he's going to this university to do this course because that's what he wants to do. As a mother, I don't like the fact that he's four hours away from me, but guess what? He's excelling. He's happy. He's doing what he point, needs to do. Was, um, on that point about the university, the Russell, Russell brand. Uh, Russell, Russell Group, yes. Yeah, man, the Russell Group, right? So mm -hmm. that brand of university, everybody, um, it, it's pushed in your face that it's the, it, it's the elite. You, you, you must aspire to get into that brand of university. All right? Now, is it, is it that aspirations and some sort of academic road modeling is is now asking our youngsters to step away from their own skin right it is so how do we combat that um I, i'm gonna bring nathaniel in all right to speak yes. on that point it is, is is the color of our skin enough as a role model if if the Russell Group, that brand of university, is more appealing, what, 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 what then? What, how do we fix that dichotomy within the community? Because what will happen is that you will have, you, you will start to now have the perpetual cycle of ra ra racism then. Because if you're entering university of a different color, then you'll, 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 you'll get some pushback, right? How, how, how do you address that? How do you see that? I mean, there's, there's several levels to this. I mean, um, a very good friend of mine, Nicole, uh, Naomi Kelman, um, Operation Oxbridge has been working with Oxford and, and Cambridge, in fact, in looking at increasing the amounts of students in Oxford University has a great deal of work to do. I've been mean, actually working with one of the colleges, one of the oldest colleges there to think about raising aspirations at a younger age. Now, the, 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 the thing with these universities is that they get a lot of international colored students so when i say colored i mean across the spectrum melanated let's just say melanated right that's probably a, a more appropriate way to describe people of color but when we're speaking about black there is more black african than black caribbean and um one of the things and one of the ways in which we can actually combat this is um is to have a higher level 
of excellence at a lower level. But what do I mean by that is whereby we now put into the minds of primary school children and parents of primary school children that if they can excel at a certain level, they will then be given and have the opportunity for grants and scholarships that will open the doors for many of these private institutions, which will then prepare them for the higher institutions, the higher education, like the Oxford, like the Cambridge and so forth. And and when you can facilitate these types of visits to Oxford, which would open their doors for young people to go and visit from a historical perspective, when the parents of the children are putting pressure on the schools to arrange trips to these institutions, whereby you set the aspiration in the mind of a young person that they can actually get to that place, then you're putting pressure with a larger volume of students then, a larger amount of pupils then, which will then go in and have the ability to go um, to these universities. Now, on top of that now, it is for the community leaders that are influencers um, to put pressure then and to join with forces of other individuals, like where you have Project Oxbridge, which is doing a great deal of work, working with the ACSs, the African Caribbean societies, the individuals that are, are, um, are, are really trying to petition heavily to uh, involve more uh, Caribbean, more black students to actually go in and be accepted into these institutions, then we begin to create um, a movement of change. On top of that now, we have the ability to then lean upon government. Now, lobbying is a very powerful tool. Many things have been pushed by powerful lob lobby groups, which have now changed legislation in the United Kingdom. Now, when we begin to mobilize as a community, when the Jamaican community, the Caribbean community, the wider community, the African community now joins forces together, we become a powerful force for good. Now, because it's like on the planet of the apes. Remember, the apes said, one, one stick weak, two sticks strong, three sticks stronger. You have a fist. And you see this fist that we're seeing people stand with, this fist of unity now is something that we need to break the barrier, to break the mold. Because as a collective, we have the ability to push over the boundaries. And when we have more, now, now you understand that what I'm speaking about in terms of pressure, because we have more children at a lower level achieving high levels of academic uh, um, uh, excellence. That is more of them, which creates greater pressure. Now we have lobby groups, which is the community coming together, putting more pressure in. Now we have then the political strategic influences that are on the councils that are in the government organizations within the public sector now putting pressure on as a collective now we will then pivot the change and so it is a complete culture shift that needs to happen because if you can remember that many of these institutions are built off the back of of um, slavery they, they have earned money off the back of slavery we had a university in in scotland that recently did some reparations back to jamaica um for acknowledging the their, um, their involvement within the, the slave trade. And, and really, this is now a time for us to um, really champion together, to come together and using this not as a way to march upon Westminster, because I don't believe, I believe the marches are very important to raise, um, you know, public awareness. But then in terms of how do you affect change? You affect change through circles of influence. You affect change through pressure. You affect change through um, economic power. And as we begin now to start to speak about these things, where Primrose had mentioned something around um, there is more than one way to make money. Um, financial literacy is something that our young people need to know because the schools are not going to teach them how to save the schools are not going to teach them how to invest the teach schools are not going to teach them how to have a financial ba um, balance or budget and this is where we now as adults as parents now can invest in their financial literacy because if they begin to compound that 10 pounds money which they get in pocket money they compound that wealth and they're compounding this 10 pounds every single week by the end of the month, they have 40. 
and then by the end of the year, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at this, this sum which they are gaining more wealth where they've got 500 and something pounds and 600 pounds at the end of the year. And then you're thinking about beginning this process at age 10 years old, what they can achieve by the time they are 20. And so having an understanding of compounding the wealth then gives them this financial literacy, which then aids again then in economic power as a collective. And thank you, Nathaniel, on that point, because you're bringing, I mean, financial literacy is really important. And while we have emphasis on our young people, what about us as the adults where we may have missed that out? Because right now during COVID, before we move on to our next um, topic, I think financial literacy and our economic collective and where we really stand in the UK, I think is a massive one. I mean, some of us are in the JLB, the JLB that gives you 12 paychecks per year. Um, according to um, statistics, some people are one paycheck away from being made homeless. And that, reali that reality is um, really real now in COVID times. Uh, with the furlough scheme coming to an end, we are seeing increasing numbers of people shops, companies where we thought they would never go are literally crumbling before our eyes. So maybe you want to give us a little insight around that pretty term that some of us may have taken for granted called multiple income streams. And well, then we'll chuck a little bit, because I think you can't just leave the financial literacy just like that. It may be one that we just want to flesh out a little bit more. I don't know if Nathaniel or Primrose. I can see I'm going to talk about something that's happened to me. Um, okay. One of the great things about being raised in Jamaica is school saving scheme. Every Friday, you have to turn up with your $2 for putting in your bank book. And if you don't have your $2, your 50 cents, I used to save, save my $2. And my savings started with Victoria Mutual. You know, and every Friday morning, your, your form teacher came and, you know, whatever you had and if you told her you had no money she'd tell you how much piece of chicken she saw you buy tuesday in the lunchroom and she'd tell you you didn't need five piece, pieces of chicken you could have done with just two and she'd tell you that she saw you buying the extra bag of banana chips wednesday afternoon why couldn't you save that 50 cents i went to school a long time ago now the, the whole the whole idea of financial literacy and I, I grew up with, with a grandfather. He had a shop. And I remember he used, to, he, used to walk, he used to talk to himself. He wasn't talking to me. He just talked to himself. And he would say, yeah, you know, this money thing, you know, it's important. And, you know, um, money belongs to the bank and it must be utilized to make your life better. And um, brick and mortar don't rotten ever. And I, I used to listen to him and I used to think, oh, made him just a mumble to himself. But he was, he was, he was mumbling wisdom into me. So, you know, somebody asked me the other day, how did you survive when you lost your job? And I didn't just lose my job. Let me tell you a little bit about my life. My husband and I had an accident. I lost my nice, nice teacher's job. I was on, I was on a trajectory to be a, a, a head teacher. Um, I loved my job. And then I couldn't work because I couldn't, the pain was so hard. And then my, I was at home so much, I got to realize that my husband was playing a whole heap of games away. And that led to the end of, of, of my marriage, which I ended up living on 10% of my household income, literally. And people say to me, how did you manage? And I had a son. I had a son that was at the time in private school because we, we, we had our son in private school. And I, I, I remember filling in some forms that were this thick to keep him, keep him there. And the one thing I'll tell you about getting the best education in some private schools because you can get it. They don't advertise scholarships, but they're there. Trust me, they're there. Scholarships and bursaries are there in abundance. You see a lot of those wealthy families, the number of wealthy families my son went to school with were three kids in the school and two of them are on full scholarship and they were paying for one and they got money rolling. So we have to teach people to be savvy. Now, one of the problems we have as a nation, we don't like to read and write nothing that's too big. These scholarship forms look like this. And I was getting them on Tuesday evening to fill out. And the bursar was getting them Wednesday morning to the point where I was shocking the woman's face off of her. Oh, you've you brought it in already. 
oh, we, we'll get back to you by the end of the week. I know you're gonna, because you won't give me that because that farm is filled out so beautifully and I went to my village overnight. It's filled out so beautifully, you can't even, you, there's nothing you can wrong about it. These are things we need to do. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about financial literacy is where we put our money. I once, I have a friend, she's not really a friend now because of what she did to her son. Her son qualified for an 80% scholarship at my son's school, which is one of the top private schools down here in, in Bristol where I live. And when she got the offer, she called me and said to me, it was too expensive. I think she had to pay something like 1,200 and something pounds um, for the term to keep him there. She said she can't afford it. And she sent him to a, a regular state school. And then towards the Christmas, she, she sent me, she emailed me a picture of her new handbag. She paid 1,549 pounds for the new handbag. And trust me, I wanted to go around to her house and beat sense into her. Now, what she taught her son is that a handbag was more valuable than a good education. That child eventually, he, she's lucky they held the scholarship or they honored the scholarship the following year because she, her child was, was a, is a genius. Yeah, he's, um, he's studying, um, I can't remember, some, some, some technical engineering at some university in Germany now. Full, full, well, full scholarship that boy is on. And I remember really having a go at her. How could you do this to your child? You're telling him to go buy a handbag. So he's not going to go out there and buy designer shoes instead of buy one house or buy a flash car instead of buy that flat so that he's got somewhere to go. And we are often, and sometimes we have to shine the mirror, the light in our faces and stand up and look in the mirror and think about the things that we do. My mother taught me about charity shop and car boot sale. I ain't ashamed to tell nobody that I go to car boot sale and charity shop. Well, I don't like car boot sale, but charity, charity shop I like. We can't take it up for no too much in the car boot sale business. But charity shop, I would go and buy stuff. I have a friend that I bought her a gift once, and she said to me, you bought this in a charity shop? Yeah. Wrap it up nice. Ooh, how do you know it's not? Lots of times you get stuff that's brand new. I'm not afraid. We as a people, no, 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 buy nobody wear this. I don't buy underwear in charity shop, and I don't buy shoes. Yeah, but everything else, one buckler, um, Zora Flora, little tip of Zora Flora, and some detail, gone. Wash it 10 times if you like. So, so, so Primrose, is that the expectation from, from the, <laughs> the majority? And I, I use majority because we, we understand who we're talking about here. All right? Um, our, our, our community is often labeled as the minority. But um, is, is the we're majority not expecting... You're right, absolutely. But um, just by, by power of mind, we, we can be uh, the majority. Do you think that they expect us to be shopping in the charity shops and do not have a flashy car, do not dress well, do not speak well? Is that the expectation that if you, if you have broken that status quo, you're likely to be pulled over and then um, you, will, you will say that, well, you're being harassed, you know, that sort of thing. Is, is that the expectation? What is our responsibility now? To frame you, you, have, you have to remember that as people who are black, dark-skinned, from the day they went to Africa and took the first shipload, their expectation of us is that we're animals and we're below them. Nathaniel, let me pick up on something he said earlier. He said, one two, three, why do you think they call us gangs instead of a group of people chatting? They're scared of us. They, that's the only way to dehumanize us and to disempower us is to take away. That's why we need to be more united. Their expectation. I'll give you another story that I have to share with you. I used to teach early years and I had two boys in my class and I hope nobody from that school is watching. And one boy was uh, mixed heritage and the other boy was white. And on a Thursday morning, I had story time. They were four years old, four. And it was the first time I was reading the book, The Gruffalo. And I had a little girl with special needs. So she would sit bang in the middle, like between my knees and I'd want, have one boy on one side and one on the other. And my head teacher, that's when she, that's when she um, assessed me on a Thursday morning. And I couldn't turn the pages quick enough. Oh, what's going to happen next? And both boys, I used to call them the twins. And when she was finished, she said, oh, Primrose, um, 
Boy X is so curious. It must be wonderful to work with him. But isn't boy Y disruptive? And I said to her, why is boy Y disruptive and boy X curious? And she said, oh, 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 what are you saying? I said, I'm asking you why one is curious and one is disruptive. Why do you think they, they sit on either side of my knee? Because I need them right in front of me. They're the same. And they're both bright boys. And she went on to talk some rubbish about, oh, we're going to have to have some, um, some, back then they didn't have BAME and diversity. It was equal opportunities training. She said, oh, oh but you don't have to come because you get it. And I said, no, I need to be in the front row to make sure my colleagues get it too. Because you, and she was a good principal, but she was conditioned to think of the black child as being disruptive as opposed to the white child curious. Their expectations of us are automatically low. We must rise above them. And we don't rise above them by shouting and screaming and thinking, as Nathaniel said, we rise above them with making uh, representation in writing. They hate when we present great big documents to them to challenge them. They don't like that. They hate when we have petitions that reach 100,000 that they have to address. They don't like that. They hate to see us standing together as a group and nobody's shouting, but we're, 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 we're presenting in standard received English. They hate all of that. But we are, we are an expressive race. Um, so how do, you, how do you curtail that? Yeah, how do you, do you curtail that in the workplace? And I, I want to bring um, Sora in as a co host you know, um, for that particular point, because you are in a territory, you, you live in a region of the United Kingdom. Is it different from, from London, per se? And, and we'll, we'll segue back into the epicenter being Bristol for, for a lot of the uprising. So, and then we'll take Nathaniel um, and point of view on the workplace. Sora. Well, the, the part of the world that I now live in is Luton. Um, I live near part of Luton called Berry Park, which is predominantly South Asian, predominantly Muslim. Um, I would say that if you want to see how they operate, and I have Councillor Burnett, who's also on this call, she might want to add a few things because she's from the same part of London that I'm from, Hackney, moved to Luton many years ago. And one thing that I notice about them is their collective action. And when I've had discussions, they really have a race first policy first and foremost there are asians here who live in mansions literally two three rows for me that i most probably not used to seeing in london and they live together everything for them is a togetherness they um they own berry park it's all their shops they own everything. I'm one of the few black people that live where I live in my clothes. They just, they just operate, they have a different operation that I think we sometimes miss around our collective financial responsibility as a community. I wouldn't say their young people don't make any trouble. When their young people get into trouble, uncle or somebody's got a business to suck them in. Our young people get into trouble, they are left out, high and dry. They don't, they're not pulled in they have no shell or cover or the opportunity to say do I straighten up myself and go with everybody to the right or do I just say that I'm going to continue on my path and go to the left and I think that's something that is very different that I see out here because they the rich Asians don't have to live in Luton there are nicer towns and villages that they could live out here in bigger houses, but they don't. They want to live on their own. Imagine I live in Berry Park, which people look down on, but you've got security box place where you can hold your golden jewelry, yeah? Everybody's like, where are you living? I said, don't worry. I, I'm, I'm cool here. It's the centre of town. They live in the centre of town. They live in the most wealthiest part in terms of land ownership. Town, town is always the wealthiest part because your property will always be valued more. People always live in the centre of town. We live way out, way out. What for? Nobody's coming out there. You're not close to the airport. Nothing. So when the council now is going to come and do the redevelopment, they're going to have to buy them out. 
everything about them is collective action. All the mosques, they own the land the mosque is built on. Ownership, ownership, ownership is key for them. And they operate and they feel comfortable in their own skin doing that, which I feel is very different from us. We're not quite comfortable with our identity. And I don't think if they are having an identity crisis now with the younger ones, they slightly got a better grip on it than we have at the moment. I don't think we see it as much. I think there's things going on underneath that. But right now we don't have a grip on it. And on that note, I would like to bring in Nathaniel because Nathaniel is an award-winning entrepreneur with many businesses and I'm sure he can give us a real education on what it means on multiple income streams. Um, thanks a lot. There's, there's so many nuggets here that uh, are being dropped. I mean, um, just to follow on from Jacqueline Burnett, uh, my godson is actually a beneficiary of um, a scholarship through Chris Imathoden. In fact, he runs a very, very excellent school, in fact, of teaching excellence from a low level. And that's how, you know, for those that are just joining, how you can get your young people into higher education, into these elite universities. Now, just in terms of uh, the conversation around financial literacy, I'm picking up on the workplace as well from, from two perspectives. Um, we have something which is known as identity. Now, it's never about sacrificing where you come from, um, but you must be adaptable. And this is the perspective that a lot of people confuse. All right, here we go. So I speak with the English accent when I'm around the British but when they are Jamaica, I talk Jamaica and become a Roma people in. Now, is the fact that I can speak with the English accent saying that I am discarding my culture? No, it's not. What it's showing is that there is adaptability in the same way that you have somebody that goes to France from Jamaican heritage that now speaks French or somebody that goes to Germany that now speaks the local language. It is the flexibility that we have as a people. So when we are in the workplace, it is not about adapting to a point of sacrificing our culture or our heritage, but it's knowing how to operate within an environment that requires us to be a certain way, not to the point whereby we are now sacrificing where we're coming from, but having the ability and the flexibility to be able to communicate in a way that they understand. Now, communication channels are critical. If you're communicating with the wrong type of language, then the people are not going to listen. So if you're coming with a certain type of language style that the person is not used to, they are not going to be listening to the language, but they're more going to be focused upon the big movements or the loud voice. Now, when you then approach it in a way which they're used to, which is now writing documentation that Primoz had mentioned, which is going through the correct channels to address the issue, which is about being and sitting on a seat of influence to, to, to basically have a statement now that is coming out from a board level to create and affect the change lower down. That's how we get the shift in the workplace. But there is, there is incredible institutionalized prejudice that exists in corporates. We know this. The statistics will say that. You, you know, you've got less than 4% of people of melanated skin that sit on senior boards. Now, when we're talking well, about... One second, Nat. Why, why did you choose to use prejudice rather than racism? What, why? Why do you use that word? I use the word, I use the word prejudice in, in that it describes um, the difference. Yeah, difference. However, there is institutional racism, and I believe there is prejudice. There is prejudice from our own people. I'll give an example. Here we go. We have black police officers that are dressed in a uniform, metropolitan police officers in a metropolitan police uniform that, that faces now prejudice from black people because they are now called a particular, um, what's the term that they use loosely um, to describe black people that are kind of falling underneath white oppression, right? So you've got black officers that are really doing their job and trying to be a good citizen by doing that job that are now, uh, that had experienced prejudice. There is also, in addition to that, there is black people that are in organizations that are higher up 
that will not lift up the ones beneath. Is it racism or is it prejudice or is it that they just don't like them? And so this is where there's a kind of, there's this kind of um, line which I'm talking about here where we have institutional racism, but then we also have prejudice within our own people. So when we're speaking now about organization, it is not about the individuals that are the white people, the white men that are thinking about the diversity policies that need to be changed because it's not about handing this to the people, but it's about inclusiveness of individuals in the process of how to now stimulate the cultural shift of that organization. It is critical for black employees that are going into corporate to have mentors because those mentors would have experienced some level of, of, of racism, some level of prejudice, some level of, 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 of hatred towards them because of the color of their skin or because of um, how they, they, they speak. They would have had that. And where they've had that experience, they have the ability to sow then into a younger generation. So that mentorship is very important and critical in the workplace. Now, just to pick up on the other point which you had mentioned, Soraya, around the financial literacy. Um, this is where entrepreneurship is critical. Teaching our young people how they can use their skill sets to earn money. I remember when I was, I, I was um, you know, younger, I would, I would actually use, I learned martial arts when I was young and I began to teach people my skill set that was earning an income. I, was in, I, I had music. I was using music as a way to earn income. And so it's harness those, harnessing those skill sets that many of our young people have to show them that they have the ability to earn extra income. Now, when you have multiple streams of income, and you fall into this, I love the term that you said, Soraya, and that you receive 12 paychecks a year. You only get paid 12 times in a job. <laughs> in a year, you know, every month you're getting this, this, this 12, this check every, I think it's a, a brilliant concept, Soraya, a brilliant concept. Because what happens... I don't know about brilliant because it feels harsh when you says it because when someone <laughs> told me, I felt that on my chest, I was like, knock out, I was like, ooh. That's, 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 exactly what I'm, that's exactly what I'm saying because the, the mindset of having a job, a job, I've heard this concept, you know, just about broke so many times now, you know, the, you know, just about broke it, you know, this, 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 this thing, um, which is a statement which many people use. Now, when we pull the rug, when we pull the rug of the job from the individual, whose fault is it that they don't have another income? Is it not their own fault that they have not manifested another form of income using their skill sets? Now, so this is where we teach our children how to do business. This is where we teach them how to harness their skill sets to earn an income. This is where we can teach them the principles, the ideas, the concepts. Now, on top of that, there are other methods which, you know, even Jamaicans Inspired is going to be doing something with the Jamaica Stock Exchange where we're going to be teaching young people how to trade. And this is where, you know, you're, you're speaking about other types of income, whereby now through, through trading, through investment, putting money behind and saving towards buying, let's say, real gold. So, you know, you have um, tiny amounts of gold, which you can purchase for pounds. And then you're thinking about hard resources, commodities. And this is a, a type of conversation we can have with our children. When I take my son out, and we're outside and, and my son will say to me, dad, can I get this? I'll say, your budget, Micah, is two pounds. And then I say, look at the price. He will look at the price, two pounds. And, and, and then he'll say, all right, he doesn't have any money for anything else. And so it's, it's, a, it's a critical skill to teach budgeting. It's a critical skill to teach saving. It's a critical skill to teach trading. It is a critical skill set that we must have to harness the skill set and to develop the, the, the natural talents that is on our young people and, and showing them how they can earn income. If they're good in front of a camera, put them on YouTube. You know, if they get, if they get YouTube and they start earning, they could earn money from YouTube. And these are the disruptive ways in which now we can now leverage um, ourselves and give ourselves this, a much more st uh, stable future because we're now not thinking about 
applying or going for a job, but we're interested now in building wealth. I always say this, those who read are the ones that lead and the ones that lead are the ones that succeed. And so even if I go to my bookshelf, my bookshelf now, I've got a range of books. I've got uh, one, um, Think and Grow, this is Think and Grow Rich. That's Think and Grow Rich, right? You have books, our young people don't read. And so this is where now you can break this down. You can read the book and you can break the principles down. If you've never ever done business before, there is enough information online. There is videos, there is content, there is YouTube. It is a great teacher these days. We have audio books. There is so much resources out there. It is our responsibility now to come together. So Nathaniel, I just want to step in there because we, we've talked a lot about our young people, but what about us here? The, the ones that are not, we're not, we're not quite then the elders, the oracle. We're in the middle there. What's our role and what we're reading, where we may have just fallen off that? Because one thing I would say is how many people have got their emergency fund to say that they can then live with no income for three to six months that's in this currently in this room now? Well, what's your advice for us? I could put that to either Nathaniel or Primrose because what, I care a lot about the young people, but some of them are under the responsibility of us at the moment. Some of them yeah, are so, legally not so allowed. Let's, let's, let's move okay. on to the parents. So I, I run a black business expo. And one of the hardest things I've had to convince people is that they're entrepreneurs and business people. I sat down with a, a, a hairdresser. And she said to me, no, man, we're just a hustle. And I said to her, how do you pay a light bill? Oh, what do we do here? How do you feed your children? What do we do here? How do you put gas in your car? What do we do here? Tell me where you're a hustler. The term hustle has a negative connotation. It's like you're doing something illegal. We're not hustlers. We're entrepreneurs. I remember I, I, my godmother is one of my biggest role models because she's a proper entrepreneur and she used to buy and sell. She was a Jamaican ICI, informal commercial importer. Yeah. But looking at her, Higla, you wouldn't know. And what my godmother used to do, if I said to her, I want X, she would say to me, now I went to Holy Child High School. Anybody here know about that school? Catholic girl school. You're not allowed to sell on the compound. I sold for the However many years I was there, I hope none of the ex-teachers not listening. But how did I sell? I went to school in the 80s. Prince, Michael Jackson, all them people was popular. Buttons were selling everywhere. Pencil, pen, pencil case, folder. I used to sell everything. And I would pack these things up in my school bag. And I would, I would talk to my friends the day before. Charlene, what do you want tomorrow? My godmother going to answer this weekend. What do you want her to bring for you? And I would line up the sale. I went to Charlotte Teachers College in the 90s. Every block had a pay phone. No phone book. So I had a phone book. You want a number? 10 cents. You come to my room after 7 o'clock, 50 cents for you to look up that number. That's how I lived. People didn't have this. When the girls were going to teach in practice, I had my big roller bag of stocking. I remember my house mother used to say, where you got a big bag of primrose? Oh, it's some extra clothes. Because I'm not supposed to sell on the compound. They have a commissary. But those girls, you had to wear stocking to teach in practice. Girls here have to do so. I sell here products. They needed cartridge paper. I had a stack of cartridge paper in because commissary going to run out. And I, I used to sell paper towel rolls for them to make TV and the empty box. I had a Saturday job and I would take from that Saturday job the inner liner, the inner roll from cellar tape and sell it to girls to make things for teaching practice. Because in Jamaica, you have to make your own things. You don't have the money to go buy anything. Yeah, I used to sell everything. I used to. Long before bag juice was a big thing, I used to sell bag juice until one girl did load me up and said I have too much bag juice in the fridge. You understand? I would make them at home and carry them on a Sunday evening, freeze them and sell them. I had a water cool, I had, a, I had, a, I had a, one of them Coleman coolers in my, in my room. And then some used to hide the stock. Oh. I used to sell. So as far as I'm concerned, I've been an entrepreneur all my life. And yet even I struggled with the term entrepreneur until I really embraced it and I had to sell it to other people. There are lots of things we can do. I had a conversation with somebody today who is going to be doing a massive job from our yard. There's so much we can do. We just need to be a little bit more creative in our thinking and our children will see us. And if your child comes to you and says, Mom, I want to do, Mom or Dad, I want to do this thing. 
they all said to them, oh, tough, that's foolishness, because we're good at that. You know, especially right, I have two points. I have, people. I have two points, uh, Abra Bruce. Mm. One being declaration of income, all right? Is it that if you don't declare your income, you're seen as an enemy of the state? And then you, should, you will be pursued um, to be questioned. I, I, I don't think you should pursue that line of questioning on right. this, Jackson. No, I, you know, we, 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 we wanted to mount, <laughs> we mount that point to, to go into the stop and search. And why are you driving this but, kind of car? Um, just you, before we go this? into that, Corey, right. I noticed right. that Sherry has a hand yeah, up. Yeah. We just yeah. let Sherry, because she's a very special lady, and she can... I'll share if you want to unmute. Hi, good evening, everybody. She needs no introduction from me. If you start with your titles and everything else, oh, swiftly, no. you get to your point. Yeah, you, you know you wasn't going to come on live and I let you get away like no, that. I yeah. really was just vibes in off the point. Um, the, um, was it? Sorry, I don't want to. Primrose. Yeah. You were speaking about entrepreneurship. I really just, I really could connect with that because one thing I struggled with was Coming from a Caribbean family, it was installed in me from young that I should be academic, a teacher, social worker, nurse, a doctor, and anything in the creative industry would be seen as I'm dunce, um, I'm lazy, you know, hairdressing is not a thing, all those type of things. So I really grew with that stereotype and I hammered in on my daughter, Nathaniel knows my daughter really well, I hammered in on her about the academics, but at 14, 15 Kelsey kept saying to me, I'm not going to uni. I don't want to wear the clothes you wear. I want to be myself. I want to be able to wear trainers and wear clothes to express myself. And I'm not going to lie to you. As a mom, I didn't want her to see the fear in my eyes, but I was like, Jesus, people are going to talk about us. You know, I've done well. It looks like I'm failing or she's gone off the, the rails. I was really worried. Let me tell you something. She really kept focus on her dreams and was like, I'm going to start this online. I like fashion mum. And like your son, Primo, she came, went away and came back to me about um, colleges in West End in top fashion and really done her research. And then I had to relook and I was like, this is me a few years ago. <laughs> this is me. Um, and I don't want to be like my mum. I don't want to cow down that type of, you know, encouragement she has. Let me nurture it. And she came in with these different colleges and I started to explain to her about the different routes in education. You know, some of them, she might have to do a three year degree. Or I said to her, look for a private college where I could pay for bits in installments and you won't have to spend that time. And you could get um, a little bit more experience because those colleges would have connections to big fashion houses as opposed to the state um, colleges. So we started to look at that. And then she came back with a whole sheet of research where she went on AliExpress to look at her products, came back oh. with, the overview of how much it would cost. And she basically said to me, I watch what you do, mom. So I've done the costings. I know how you deal with your clients because I hear you and this is what I need. I looked at her and I was like to her, mm, okay, but think about maybe going uni just to back up. You see when this virus hit in, that's when I really looked at what she was saying and I realized that, you know that saying you're never too old to learn? She really mm -hmm. schooled me again because what I realized in the virus was the big CEOs of all the corporate companies, yourself and I know, were having meetings in their front room with their pajamas on. They just done their makeup and put on a decent shirt. So they were now on the same even playing level as the admin girl, you know, the senior manager, the people that work on the ground. We're all the same now. We cannot sit in different offices with a plaque on our door that differentiates us. We're all here. And I also realized, irrespective of what everybody's job was, nobody's safe. So when she came and was showing me that drive and she told me how much she needed, I started to look into it and I helped her to launch her shop. But I said to her, we're not going to do no business on the side where you just promote on Instagram and you're not paying. You have to understand, Kelsey, this needs to be a business. Do your website, get ambassadors and follow the blueprint. Don't rewrite it. Follow the blueprint. And she's done really well. What I started to do was look in my network. So one of my friends who's an artist, a musician, his wife works for QVC and has her own range. She makes little key rings for Christian Dior, Christian Louboutin, stuff like that. And I just plugged Kelsey with her. And the first thing I said to her was, I would really expect your knowledge and experience because growing up, to me, I shone this industry. 
I genuinely don't want to learn it, but I want to be able to give her the best advice. So this year has definitely made me rethink about how we encourage young people to do entrepreneurship. And yes, I go out there and teach other people's children to do that, but it only really is genuine when you're applying it to your own child with a genuine heart. Then you can step out and say, yes, the information I share with other people's children is right. And I believe in it because from doing so, her confidence has excelled. And as you were saying, these young people master this social media thing, you know. They make millions on YouTube yeah, to great. sit down and do makeup tutorials. My daughter sits here and watches people and I watch the numbers at the bottom of the screen and I ask her questions and she'll tell me, oh, you need a ring light and a good microphone. So not only are they learning about business, but she's learning about sound, lighting, um, you know, staging. And um, if you want to say like, you know, when you put a film, you stage a set. They know how to put together a mini set. Mm -hmm. And then this is when I really said to my daughter today, because she came to me a few months ago saying she wanted another business idea. And I called her today and I said, listen, I think I'm going to consider that idea again. Come to me with a plan of people that you can rent the chairs to in that space first. I need to see how much money is. And I'm really excited for the kids. I'm really, I'm really positive. The virus, I've got a really positive I don't know. I'm so happy. Such a good time. I can't explain. It's just a good time if you adapt to change. But we must invest in the kids. They know what they're doing. They're experts. They really are experts. They just need a bit of business guidance. So maybe to keep the cash flow sheet, which I taught my daughter to keep stock, teach them about Shopify. They'll actually teach you how those platforms keep check of stock. And we're actually doing things a bit the old time way. So I really just wanted to connect with Primrose on that because it was something that was really pivotal and um, it's, it's really, um, it means a lot to me when it comes to young people and entrepreneurship and believing in their ideas, believing in them. That's, that's the important thing. Once I changed my belief in my daughter, she didn't know I was just supporting because I was her mum, but I actually believed in what she put together. She's, she's marketed. She pays for her Facebook ads herself. She, she does her, her thing. So you know, it shows them so, not so to Shari, be dependent. So, so Sherry, um, what would what would you say your daughter's responsibility is at this moment? Judging from how she has um, learned the the, um, the skills of the trade, then uh, what would her responsibility be? So she keeps stock. So she's responsible for checking her stock and stock and. No, as it really is the race, race responsibility. Oh, race. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's really? interesting about Kelsey um, and I think this is part of my influence I'm going to be very honest um, I read Condoleezza Rice's autobiography many many years ago and I think I've influenced her opinion in saying this we don't believe in outward aggression noise making movement we agree in impacting individuals on a basis of one by one and on a place of power so I have I don't know if this is something bad I could call her and she could maybe share her opinion, but I have tried to gear her towards to not publicly speak out on anything, but be the one who strategically writes a letter to the person in power or to get her group of friends to pressure at people on Instagram and at them on Twitter, but do not take a start. If you understand what I'm saying, do not just use your platform and start talking about, Oh, black people ill-treated because of George Floyd. I've explained to her strategically that in life, people um, have different positions. You've got those who need to go on the field and make noise, but you need a consortium who is writing together the strategy and the pressure groups are pressuring the government and the lobby trying to get change. And those who are reaching out to the university who are trying to get evidence so we can use that that uh, academic evidence um, that psychologically we've been um, impacted by transatlantic slave. I want Kelsey to be in that position, not on the ground making noise because I know how it could impact her bread and butter daily if she goes out and does so. I'm, I'm being very honest to you. And, and that's what we want um, on this forum. That's exactly what we want. Um, we're looking through the chat and you know, that was my second, my second point. And, you know, my co-host, Soraya, alluded to that. So and thank you very much, um, Soraya. But is it, is it our second income stream, third, fourth income stream that, that, that's causing the stop and surge and, and 
this bitterness that 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 is on the street i, I know we're in a season where it's black lives matter about the movements as, as sherry mentioned you know it, it's sometimes people mount their own agenda upon something that is that is so impactful and we mentioned bristol being the epicenter of uprising <laughs> and uh, because you choose the word uprising and why why bristol bristol has been so instrumental um over the past um decades if, if we can just probably sum that up in, in probably a minute or two then we look at what what's the direction and, and why, why is it so disproportionately um uh, measured um our voices why, why is it so disproportionately measured as a, as an award-winning um journalist so take it from that point please well bristol is is an amazing city it's a very special city and a lot of people who don't know anything about the history of black activism in the uk would never have heard of bristol so bristol is responsible for a lot of major major things that have happened when it comes to race relations in this country in 1963 uh four young men took the bristol omnibus to task when they wouldn't hire black conductors that led to the race relations act and that happened right here in bristol if you go to the guardian of last thursday you will see an article about the man who stopped the buses yeah, he boycotted the bus, just like Rosa Parks did. Ironically, he was never a bus conductor or driver. His wife and his friend was turned down for a job as a bus conductor. So that's 1963. Some of we never born yet. Um, fast forward to the 80s when you had all the... And Bristolians do not accept the word riot. That is a, riot, a word that has come down from the establishment to, to destabilize any kind of action we take seriously. And when they took the bus company to task, they did it in writing first. They first wrote to the bus company. The bus company said to them, no, go away. We don't have any regard for you people. So they went to their communities and they started petitions and movements. No one marched. They just stopped taking the bus. It's as simple as that. You want to hurt people, you go to their pockets. Then you come to the 80s now, the first uprising that started in the 80s, long before Brixton and Toxteth and Liverpool and anywhere in the great city of London, Bristol started that right there on Grosvenor Road in St. Paul's. 40 years today when that started. We, uh, not today, this year, um, we've had the 40th anniversary. It was in April. Fast forward to the whole Mark Duggan case. There was a lot of involvement from Bristolians. And of course, the removal of, of Edward Colston. Now, so one people might wonder about the Colston statue. A lot of people don't know the history of Colston. A lot of black people don't know the history of Colston. I learned about Colston when I was in Jamaica. I learned about the feudal system and why all these explorers who thought the world called him the fool, who thought the world was, um, was, was square and that if you went to the horizon, you'd fall off. The Francis Drake and the Christopher Cumbacus and all them people, they were all, they were all they were explorers, but they were quite thick because of how they thought. And then they went out and they found the new world and then you had all this stuff happening and you had the hierarchy and, and, all, and all these things going on. Edward Colston is a philanthropist. My son benefited. That's why I forced, my, forced myself to get those scholarships because I want their money to build my people because you built your money on my people's backs. I'm not marching and fighting you. No, I'm coming to you with letters and forms and petitions. And, and presentations that you can understand. You, when I start talking to you, you can't tell me, oh, I don't understand this. I read the dictionary for fun. I dare you to tell me I haven't written the right word. So those are the things that we need to consider. So Edward Colston statue stood in the center of Bristol, prime position on a plinth. And for years, uh, not years, decades, white people, Asian people, immigrants, black people, Powerful people in this city were embroiled in conversation about removing the statue. It's not the other day they've been asking for it. They've been asking for the statue to come down for over 40 years. The council kept saying we need to consult with the city. No one consulted with the city in 1873 when they put it up. The city was not consulted with. The city's elite put it up because the rest of the city consisted of peasants. 
So we are now taking the place of the peasants. So we're asked, we've been asking for it to come down. And like I said, it's not just black people asking to come down. If you look at those videos again, you will see that it's not just a black person who took that statue down. So that's, that's the significance of Bristol. And we call those things uprising. And I like the word uprising. It's rising up. It's positive. We're not rising. We're not abandoning the place. We're not teasing nobody about the things. We're not into that. I'm not into that. And I can't march. I got a bad back plus my shoes that might mash up if I'm marching. I like to sit down and write letters. I, there's a power in writing something and sending it off to someone and then getting a response that said, we're delighted to. We're pleased to say you have gotten. I love that. There's this, there's this massive feeling or somebody say, oh, we've received your complaint. We, can we meet to discuss? You've heard me. I'm not get spellings wrong. You can't tell me some spell one word wrong. We could have talked butter from here to tomorrow. You can't write a letter like me. And that's what we need to start doing. We need to start fighting the system with the language they know. Use their language to get back at them. They don't like it, but they can't criticize it because you didn't shout. You were not intimidating. You were not angry and confrontational. You were not frightening. You know, you weren't an angry black woman or a thug. Oh, no. You come at them with their own words. And then they sit there and think, oh, my God, how do I destroy this person? But you got them thinking in a way that they've gone a little bit funny while you're okay. just rising behind them. Sorry. So on that note, I would like to invite Councillor Jackie Burnett because this will follow on very seamlessly because Jackie is a staunch my girl from Hackney, love her, <laughs> love her to bits. I've been watching you nodding your head, you know. <laughs> I mean, if you want to know Thank how you. to write and speak their language... Take the floor, Jackie. Yeah, I, I just wanted to come in and thank you. And it's been really lovely to see everybody here and to listen to everybody. I just wanted to say one of the things I just wanted to add, I think it was Cherry's point about um, not doing certain roles. I'm minded with the role of protest, and I'm talking about the role of protest. I've always been in a, in a sort of funny position because I know the role of protest has given us the rights we hold today. Yeah, and I think that's what we've got to be really careful when we speak. And I have to say, my daughters have challenged me because I remember the Brixton riot, the Tottenham riots and all that being from London, being from Hackney. So I remember when it happened. I remember when um, the PC in Tottenham was, was um, happened and how the black community was affected as a result because you wouldn't even put on your application where you lived because you were afraid of where it would go. But at the end of the time, it did give a lot of gains to some people. Maybe not to me, but some people did ride the rave and benefited and made their life better because of the legislation that came back. So we've got to be mindful what we say to our children. And this is dealing with Cherry. So when George Floyd was murdered, I didn't want my child to go and protest because I keep thinking, ah, why protest? Why march? Because what different does it mean? I don't want your, the youth to get cracked up and, and criminalised. However, if they never did protests in London, the Colston stuff would never have got pulled down. I would not be getting a little ease in politics because now talking about race is more acceptable than it was six months ago. Six months ago, when I spoke about black, I got racially gaslighted. Yeah. Why are you speaking about black? So I'm just saying this, that we need to be co constantly evaluating those who are prepared to put their neck on the line for us when we are not, because because they do it, they make our life better. Because we are afraid to do it, they've made it easier for us. And they've made sometimes the ultimate sacrifice in their career because we weren't prepared to do it. Because I tell you what, the Asians ain't got no problem to find a way to come out when they're ready. Yeah, and this is what we've got to learn. It's about the role of protest within a strategy not protest for protest's sake and i was very proud of my daughter she went back to hackney 
M sang because she's an artist at in um, Newington Green. So the journey we're on, we never know where things are going to come full circle because I'm from Hackney, born and bred. And I can switch and speak Cockney when I'm ready. I'll go into a Cockney accent. But as Nathaniel say, when I'm on the, on the phone, people go, oh, I didn't know you were Caribbean Jackie when I was into finance. People would be amazed. But please, let us not. We're in a massive opportunity now that we have not ever had. Let me just say that, yeah? Corporate world now is, yeah, yeah, I want some blacks. I want some blacks. You know how long there have been people's been knocking at the door to get blacks? So I just wanted to say that less because I have lost jobs. I have not had jobs because I put my neck on the line, not protesting, but speaking up for black because I've always been comfortable in my skin. But there are others that have lost much more and have ended up like Primrose and me and others. So I just wanted, it. my child has made me think really about the role of marching because of what I saw in the 80s. And we need to protect them, what our colleagues are saying. We are the elders, so we must protect them to use their democratic right is to process. Watch Hong Kong. Yeah, England's going to bring over 3.5 million next year starting they've used the right to protest to remind the british government of the promise they made 20 odd years to them to protect them so this is the role of protest so and i'm a trade union as well but i'm not <laughs> as, so i'm mindful of all what has been given and afforded to those because somebody put their neck on the line so i just wanted to share that because our young people they're ready to move and they're moving as a collective. So, but Soraya's right. We're still um, having to be economically active until 70. So how do we help th the generations behind? So I'm really thankful to meet all of you. And I didn't mean to talk too long, but protest is important because it was bonding the black plantation while we got our freedom because it wasn't economically viable for Britain to keep sending ships to the Caribbean. So it has its role. But I hear what you're saying, Rob Prince Rose, about the burning down. We don't want to do that nowadays. No need to. So please get part of the system and learn it. All right. But there's, there's, there's an addition to that. In university, I was shocked in one of my lectures uh, we had a presentation, and the individual individual came from 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 the depths of Parliament to say that you should protest. You're speaking to the cohort and say, "Look, you have to demonstrate that you support a cause, and you should protest." How that protest look? It was not. It, it was not said that you should march. You should write letters, and, but you have to stand for something. And and I think using the best the the best method that suits your journey, your message, um, should always be encouraged, and be mindful of what you're protesting for, and against. You know, it's it's good to have that information. And Jackie, you're you're spot on. Sherry, I, I see exactly what you're, you're, you're saying, and you're spot on. We have to move as a unit, identifying our strengths and identifying who can support our weakness. So unit is a must. Jackie, you know, sorry, I had mentioned that you, you know, hands down, you, you write seamlessly. Primrose, you are a thesaurus in your own right. So, can you think what 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 kind of unit this could be with Primrose and Jackie and Jackie right? <laughs> writing a um, for us? That's something. I do like things. Bristol. It's very nice down there. I've got a sister down there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, 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 it is good. Who that is, I probably know her. <laughs> All right. So, so for those who are who will be viewing on 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 Facebook, um, Jamaicans dot com, and of course our very own Jam Jamin UK. Um, 
conversation continues and we are encouraging you to add your comments because it will be there for a very very long time this recording will will be played over and we want it to be shared far and wide because this is a start we have to start we have to change the conversation we can't be hard to know that in the population we have to ask difficult questions raise responsibility we have to be responsible i've seen our our, our colleague member keisha who is also a journalist um, on on this call and at some point would like to bring Keisha in because she's a, she's a parent. That sort of thing. What's what's your responsibility? We we have to now segue um, into the other topic that I'm sorry I will introduce. And I want to be the host, but I want to be very honest. How to be honest with this topic, Sarah? You are breaking up for. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. So you're breaking, you're breaking up. So we are slightly running out of time, but one of the things that we just need to go back to and maybe talk a little bit more because it's come up time and time again in conversation is looking and it relates back to identity. We might be going back into ego, but the separation of black Caribbean and the black African experience and in the different settings and the place and I would like to talk about it especially in the workplace now where we have hyper visibility on us what's our responsibility in the J-O-B and I'm going to take that to Nathaniel and some of the work that you're doing with a particular corporate yeah, I mean, um, this is a really important um, thing um, to actually discuss. When you're talking about Black African and Black Caribbean, um, in particular in the workplace, I mean, um, I, I'm a patron at the EY Ernest & Young Foundation, and um, one of the things that I was drawn into was actually looking at their new race re um, uh, policies and their new policies around diversity. And um, where they presented the statistics, these statistics... Um, reflected um, the amount of black people. But then when we are talking about black, we have to break it down into Caribbean black and African black because the experience is very, very, diff very different. Um, you know, the, the black Caribbeans have lived there for a number of years. They've had to go through various different challenges. They've ha had to really fight racism. Where we're finding that, you know, when the African families come here, of course, they do experience levels of racism, but their experience and their cultural experience is completely different from many of us. When we're talking about education, there are more black Africans which are getting into university, for instance. There are more black Africans which are being employed by certain corporates. But then when we're talking about black Caribbean, they are within the high percentage of young people that are not achieving in school. They are the ones which are more likely to be stopped and searched and incarcerated in prison. Um, we're talking about within the workplace, they are more likely to not get the job than over the black African. And so <clears throat> we find that there's even this disproportionality within this framework of just general black. And, and, and I believe that it's really important for us to actually put pressure um, to dismantle, completely obliterate this concept of BAME. To completely, you just right. completely, completely, completely get rid of it. The reason being is that we cannot put an Eastern European in the, sa in the same group as, as, as Black, right? But within this BAME concept, we do have Eastern Europeans that are in BAME. Uh, the Asian experience, in fact, I once heard... And Indians say that we are the good brown, that the good brown gets the jobs, but the lowest of the good brown is the blacks. Now, <laughs> the lowest of the brown is the blacks. The, the lowest of the brown skinned people is the blacks. And it's important that we are not meshed into this concept and this idea of inclusion, because inclusion does not mean equality. Now, if we're included in a group, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're on the same salary. You might be part of the same group, but you might not be on the same salary. And so the, 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 the topics and the, the words which have previously been used around equality, 
is important. The words in which we use around black is important to frame black Caribbean and to frame black African. Because now when we're speaking about stop and search, when we're speaking about incarcerations, black Caribbean, showing the black Caribbean and then that emphasis, which needs to be played then into black Caribbean, I think is critical. Um, as opposed to just this this whole concept of black. Now you might say, okay, this is quite is, is creating some level of division. I I, I don't believe it's creating division. I, I believe it's actually um, just highlighting a further problem within the Caribbean community in particular, and 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 whereby we can bolster now the support from other organizations. In fact, now leaning upon our African brothers and sisters to then support the Caribbean, leaning on, leaning on each other to actually support each other. Um, so it, I, I think that within, I think that within corporate in particular, we have got to start to challenge this concept of the inclusiveness and start to promote equality. We have to begin to um, break down the figures that they give us in terms of they say, okay, we've increased our black representation by 25%. But then of that 25%, how many, of the, how many are actually from, from, the, from the black Caribbean community over the black African community? Again, it's really putting pressure. It's really trying to establish a different type of conversation around BAME, dismantling BAME, really promoting black, getting them to disband it. In fact, I know that EY is no longer going to be using the word uh, BAME and now is going to be thinking of other concepts of introducing new types of words to describe, um, you know, people of, of color. Right. I'd like to add to that. Um, I'm, I'm a very vocal person and I, I work in a situation where being black, female and vocal doesn't really work for your employment. But I remember um, there was a story. So I, I worked for BBC and we were doing a story one Sunday night and um, the first word in the sentence was BAME. So just before my show is the Asian hour and then my show is the African heritage hour. So I said to my producer, who's actually quite a sensible guy, I said to him, is the BAME I'm reading here referring to Asians or black people? And he said, oh, you do the African Caribbean show, Primrose. I said, then I'm going to say African heritage. Is that a problem? Oh, no. Now, one of the things is, if you want to lessen something, you stick it in a box and you don't let it out. If you really want to hide something, you lock it away in a box. You don't let it come out. Now, I have to raise something that Jacqueline said because she must have been reading straight through my very, 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 very um, transparent mind. I don't like the word BAME. Sorry, B-A-M-E, BAME, whatever. I don't like the word inclusive. I don't like the word diversity. I don't like the word equality. I like equity. Because equity means that every single opportunity that you are getting an outcome, I'm getting it too. And there's a picture that circulated on Facebook quite some time ago. It's a picture of three people standing at a fence to watch a game. One person was very tall, one person was medium height, and one person was very short. They gave every single person one box to stand on. The tall person became even taller. The medium height person just barely reached the fence, and the short person was still there looking, where am I? And then the next picture showed them the short person on two boxes, the medium person on one box, and the, the tall person, no box. They were all the same height. That's what I want. I don't want no equality. I don't want your diversity and I don't want your inclusion. I want equity. Whatever it is that you're giving to Soraya, I want the same thing too. What I do with it is my issue, but you need to provide it for me too. We, 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 Soraya, um, you brought up the issue of identity. I just told you the story of the two boys. Our children are not seen as equitable in any situation. They go into school. They're a bit upset. They're angry. Yeah. I could share stories after stories after stories after stories. I nearly died in May because a nurse wouldn't listen to me tell her my symptoms. I had to go to hospital in May in a demigla COVID. Can you imagine how I felt? Because a nurse who's meant to be looking after me told me, you're not meant to have those symptoms. 
you're not meant to have those symptoms. I nearly died. That is no joke. Yeah? And it's a case of if I wasn't strong enough and I'm a weak, pop-down self, I would have died because I would have listened to her tell me, you're not meant to have those symptoms. Why am I not meant to have those symptoms? Black women can't have the same symptoms as other people? No. And we hear the stories over and over. Our children tell them to us. Our elders tell them to us. Pregnant women tell them to us. And it's across the board. We have to start doing something and actually demand this equity. You know, the other day, you must have heard about the job cuts at BBC. I sit in a, in a group of people, although I tick five, four out of the five BBC diversity boxes, four me one tick, yeah? They wanted to get rid of me. I was directly in the firing line. They wanted to get rid of lots of my other female colleagues. And do you know what we did then? Oh God, did we shot them. We united. We united. And then we had, we, we, we went to all these, all these famous people that used to have been tweeting. Holy, holy for those tweets were behind them. We don't do it ourselves. We got the village. We got white people, Asian people, Eastern European people, all the vain people that they, they want to listen to, all the powerful people. We united. There are lots of things that we should be doing as a community that we, I love the word community. It, if you break it down, it means come to unite. That's what community means. We've got to start coming together to unite. We have to. It don't matter where we come from. It don't matter where you live. I'm a technophobe. I'm, I'm on Zoom. I mean, come on. We don't have barriers anymore to communication. We don't have those things anymore. There's a gentleman here, I'm sure. Um, Edward, you're in France, aren't you? Yeah? Yes, I am. Yeah, um, him speak French. I heard him the other day. And, and what is your uh, <laughs> perspective on racism in, in France? Um, and what's okay. our responsibility in the community, Edward? All right, um, guys, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, really, I've been listening for a while. Sorry, but my phone battery just died, so I, I was out for a minute. Um, before I get even on the French topic, I just wanted to share an experience. <laughs> that I had in school because, I mean, I'm from a poor family. I wouldn't say dirt, stone, poor, but I mean, we didn't really have it, you know. We had enough to live and whatever. So I remember I wanted a, a, a video game, a Nintendo at the time. And obviously my parents couldn't afford that. So, and even if they could, they would not have bought it. So I came up with a brilliant idea that I was going to sell chocolate, it was, at school to try to make money. And, you know, I went to the wholesale, I bought, I think it was Lion and Catch, and I don't even remember the third one <laughs> at the time, to sell chocolate at school. I go to school now, Manchester High, <laughs> with people from all different social works, um, backgrounds and stuff, get to school, and for the life of me, I just did not have the courage to take out that, those chocolate and sell. And they were in my bag for... Forever. I never, ever sold any. Because um, there was just, just that negative connotation with regards to people who sold things. Or ICI, as Primo said earlier. So I just wanted to share that. And I mean, we were also streamed according to our academic abilities. And those who were considered don't speak me at the time, they were put in the accounting and the, they had accounting, principal, principles of business mm -hmm. and office procedures. Those were the three mm -hmm. subjects. And the dance one them were sent to do those. And the others of us were sent to do French and um, chemistry and literature, biology. chemistry, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I, I was really angry about it um, up to recently because now that I've started to like branch out and to do business, and I'm like, this is something that I've been missing for years, that entrepreneurial aspect to life, our outlook on life, even something like typing. When, when I went to university and I typed my first essay, it took me like two days to just <laughs> type 1,500 words because I was just there joking. I didn't have the, that business sense. And I think that if we want to overcome race, relations, or prejudice, it has to go through 
entrepreneurial and business. I think that's it, it's it's becoming even clearer for me. Now that I'm here in France, uh, there is what I would call institutional racism. Institutional racism, which um, doesn't really bother anybody because the state is so... I was saying to Corey yesterday that France is a welfare state. And so, you know, very socialistic in nature. And so the state has been so good to people who are immigrants, who are from a minority background, that they're just comfortable. But they're not really climbing the social ladder. So, mm -hmm. for example, you're going to get maybe a social housing, you're going to get your free health care, you're going to get cheap education. So you have a lot of blacks or Arabs who have um, masters or even higher degrees, and they're going to work as a security at um, a supermarket because they're not able to pierce through that um, glass ceiling in France. I was working at a school, for example. I worked in an international school, and we have 70 nationalities in terms of students. It's a, it's a school for rich people, you know? 20,000 a year, ambassadors, prime ministers. I have former Italian prime ministers, and that, that's the profile of the people who come there. I'm the only black teacher. I'm the only black teacher, and when I got there, I was only given um, nine hours. It was a nine-hour contract. I didn't want to take it, but a friend of mine said, you know, you can take it, and maybe when you're there, you'll start getting, you know, a proper contract. So I did, and obviously my charisma and my ability to get things done, you know, I created a lot of events, and, you know, in no time, even though I was the black teacher, I was called the rising star. So I got way up there ahead of all the other teachers. And they weren't used to that type of thing. So they were printing things like, oh, I am the toy boy of the principal, and we're, me and I, we're sleeping together. And whole heap of rumors, just because one black teacher now is there and getting you know, a certain number of positions, which they're not used to here in France. If you look at the television, there was one black journalist on French TV, and he's, now, he's no longer presenting. He's now doing a magazine program. There was one black politician who was a very intelligent woman. Um, they described her as a monkey. <laughs> they had her out there as a monkey, and she was very intelligent, you know, very literary when, when it came to speech. She expressed herself better than any one of them. But she was constantly attacked to be, you know, less than the rest because she was black. And, French, and the French are not used to seeing black people in prominent positions. In fact, when I came to the UK, I was like, what am I doing in France? Because at least in the UK, I saw, you know, there were blacks on the BBC. I saw, I went to the health centers and there were black people everywhere in different in the banks etc you'll never see a black person in a bank here in france even though france has one of the highest immigration rate or people coming from africa who come to france so we have a we have a big problem here but nobody touches it because the state will give you a free house or they will give you um unemployment benefits or they will give you social benefit if you're not working so it becomes we're so dependent on the state that we don't really see that, you know, we're discriminated against, if you will. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, thank you. That, that's, 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 in, that's an important point. I didn't know that the French view UK as, as we're going to use some words now, Primrose, that you don't like, as being inclusive and diverse. <laughs> Right. A, a lot, a lot more than us. A lot more than right. us. So I suppose, I suppose, um, calling for, calling for that policy change a couple of years ago, um, the, the inclusion, you know, inverted commas, Jacqueline, you, you can relate to that. Nathaniel can relate to that as well. Um, it's, it's really for sure um, to let people probably around the world think 
uh, that yeah. you know boxes are being ticked. All right, then, Soraya, uh, uh, we, we're gonna go. Just one. You're saying something, Edward. Just one last thing I wanted to share, personal experience. This one fresh out of the oven. <laughs> last year, we did a yearbook. You know, each year the school does a yearbook. And in the yearbook, they have expressions from the teachers. Usually, when we do yearbook in Jamaica, it's like normal, like sayings that the teachers usually say. So they were trying to be funny. I don't know if they were trying to be funny or what. But I think they went online and found a Jamaican expression, anything too black, no good. And when I got the copy of the yearbook, I saw Mr. Boucher. And my favorite expression was anything too black, no good. And I'm a picture. And when I started to be like, you know, this is not acceptable. And what if are the people them? Nobody went with me. Nobody else thought it was a big deal in the entire school. Maybe one other teacher and a half. One and a half. I would say, you know, felt uncomfortable. But for them it was, oh, oh, it's just kids. It's not, you know, and this is even though they had adult teacher editors. And they allowed that to, <laughs> I can show you, the, if, um, I might do a screenshot of the page, anything to black the good under my, under my name. And maybe I was a bit too, because I mean, the director of the school, they're like, oh, you know, it's a mistake. We're going to apologize, whatever. We don't want a big scandal. And maybe I was too forgiving or too soft, I don't know, to just let it go by. And that's what they do to us. They wear us in, down into submission because right. they, they, they see what you're up against. So they think, ah, oh, he's going to go quiet in a while. I'll just say sorry. I might even give him a little pay rise. They, they, they drive you into submission and that's where the difficulty, or they drive you, they, they start saying little things like, oh, and then suddenly your work's get your work gets called into play or you're not doing this, you're not doing that. We're going to have to let you go, yeah. you know, because you're making noise. You're not making the right noises. And, and right. That, is, that is actually something they, 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 they put in. It's systemic, actually. Very, very systemic. And, you know, there are lots of little things and it's the little covert ways of um, wearing you down. Well, 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 and on that note, folks, it's a wrap. We weren't meant to go on for this long, but as you know, this is complex. <laughs> it's complex. We needed to give it the time. We needed right, to uh, get those rich experiences to really... Uh, hold on, hold on, sorry, just, just before, before you, you wrap. Uh, well, just you know, I'm on my hybrid Jamaican, Jamaican time. Two? Yeah, I know. Oh, Look, I, want to check part which, two. I want to check There's which, not part two. There's part two. There's yeah. part three, four, five, six minutes. There's a whole chronicle. Remember the... Right. Botanic? And we'll close have to check with Cherry. The, the older on. ones of us. That's what this is, Primrose. We ain't, we ain't yeah. finished. We're not stopping. But... Right. Hold on, sorry. Let me, let me check with Sherry if she's got Althea with her. Um, just just for uh, the break into the next forum. Um, do you, sorry, do you have Altia with you? If you don't have Altia, then that's that's when we we have to to leave it there and reschedule for the other town hall meeting, which will focus a little bit more on the stop and search, right? But just as a just as an introduction to to what stop and search. Um, would look like all right oh you've got her all right so Altia we've got Altia um, Altia said um, uh, Altia was literally just disconnected I'm not sure if her battery ran out just bear with me yeah. all right just right so Nathaniel I'm just 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 a lead just a lead until we get Altia back in for a couple of minutes and then and then we wrap stop and search is it disproportionate um, of, and of why is it? it and why, mean, why is it so? Hold on, that and what? I know, I, I know, it is one of those <laughs> ones that will evoke so much emotion that this forum is will not be the forum for it to to to, to, to do it justice. Um, 
and why is it dis disproportionate and how can we take responsibility as a race? Well, to answer the question, it, it is 110% it is disproportionate. Um, when we're looking at the amount of young black people that are stopped in search, um, the figures have not really changed in terms of the many years of from even going back uh, to the McPherson report on the Metropolitan Police to now, I mean, there has not been much change in that. And the the problem that exists is, is that um, Primo had actually mentioned this, that it is systematic, it's a system, systematic problem. It is an institutional problem, which is riddled and is built and engraved into the culture of the police. And um, when we're talking about this in terms of um what we can do because this forum is definitely not you know we don't not gonna have enough time to really unpick this one because it's such a huge topic it really is and it's layered it's layered throughout the whole criminal justice system when we even speaking about the wrong advocacy from the lawyers to the magistrates because when stop it when section 60 was removed then the same equal amount of numbers were going to prison so what was that suggesting? That the magistrates and that the, the courts had this prejudice, had this racism. Then when you're talking about it going back in to the police, section 60, we still have the same amount of stop and search, the same amount which are incarcerated. In fact, stop and search is so ineffective. It is only 20% effective. There is nothing no, no social enterprise, no, no business, no, no um, intervention, if it is only 20% effective, would be used. They wouldn't get the funding for it. So then why is this stop and search still being implemented when it is so ineffective? On top of that, when we're speaking about the arrests, which those who are um, arrested from stop and search, the numbers from my good friend Katrina's organization, Stopwatch, when you're looking at the statistical information, you're finding that is not they're not being arrested for for holding a knife, but they're being well, arrested for a lower level. Uh, well, I tell you, I, I, I tell you, it's a lot to unpack for the next town hall, and I think that is the uh, that's going to be the right. only topic. I think yeah, the only topic, the only topic. Uh, well, I have one question, guys. Um, do you have anonymous CVs in or resumes in in the UK or not? Or how will you guys address that? It depends on the employer. Depends so the public employer. sector is different from co um, corporate. So in public sector, they do some form of anonymization, but I'm not sure about CV because in public sector, we fill out application form, which is different from giving your resume. But, but I, that's something that will come into the next town hall. Event. We didn't talk about, like I said, the workplace in depth just because one of our panelists was not very well this evening. So we're just giving you snippets of what's coming. So those of you who know about Botanica Encyclopedia, that's how we're going to be building this. <laughs> I don't know what the online, because I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm getting on that, on the edge there. <laughs> but I'm glad that you, all of you took the time to join us on a Friday evening. Um, this was sparked for us actually this week due to conversations in the Jamaican inspired um, WhatsApp group. Um, there was a picture shared of a local woman, Borenwood, being arrested outside of a jeweler's, which some of you may or may not have seen, and other things. And we just thought we just had to bring this together. Um, but what we wanted to come was from a very different place. We've had Black Lives Matters. We've had, you know, people doing the blackout squares on Instagram. That in itself was very interesting because I'm of the time of when Rodney King was the biggest thing that was on national TV. I have come a long way on that journey and even looking on Instagram and seeing some of the brands that I know a lot of well-known Black famous people where have not even doing the Instagram black square really taught me where we really stand in this. So we're at a really pivotal point, but we want to come with solutions and really understanding our race responsibility in this because there's a lot of yep, 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 yep. That's nice. 
But we've taken our time in J- Jamaica Spice to really think about this because we are a solution oriented youthful organization. And I say youthful because youthful because using the word that primrose don't like, we're inclusive. Otherwise, some of us wouldn't be able to be on this conversation or in the team the way that we are. So I just want to really thank everybody for their attention because we've been going since about 6 p.m. and some of us before that. So it's a long time to be on Zoom, but we don't want to fatigue you. We just want to give you snippets. And we will be coming at you again with a new, new date and a new time for the next Town Hall event. But I'm going to hand over to my co-host, Corey to add his Scotch bonnet sauce as it is. Yeah, Jamaican. I with a, a, a great sauce. I um, just want to say thank you very much for your, yeah, you know, your, all of your input. Um, Primrose, thank you for the perspective on the Southwest. Uh, most definitely, um, to join. Um, congratulations, Monique, on the birth of your your child, and I hope this has, you know, has has been. A little bit of a cushion and and probably raised up as pillar as you raise your child. Um, Sherry John's as usual. Thank you for your input, Jacqueline. Uh, most definitely, Vanessa Pete, um and Milks, Elaine Campbell, uh, Merce, um, also. Thank you so much. Here on Zoom and then by extension, the thousand that would have been doing on Facebook that Jamaicans.com and of course our very own Jamaican inspired. This has been a great town hall meeting. Um our responsibility. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your time. And yeah, we've come to an end. Just make sure you check our website and Facebook pages for more information. And I want to say God bless, good night, enjoy the rest of your weekend.